All right, All right good, evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and, and uh, welcome, welcome back, back to, to the Sydney, Sydney saxophone Q and A sessions. Uh, uh, hope you have been, been well wherever well you've been, been. and, and um, uh, big, uh, big congr congratulations, congratulations to our friends, friends in Melbourne. Um, uh, I hope you're enjoying your, your uh, uh, newfound freedom, freedom out and about, and about there, there at the moment. The moment. Um, now, now, this evening, this evening we, have we have an extraordinary, an extraordinary guest. guest. Um, um, he is, he is a, a living, living legend, legend of saxophone, saxophone in Australia. Australia. Uh, uh, he, he has worked, worked with, with, you know, any, any you, could you could just name, just name uh, 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 you know, the, the, it's the rap sheet so, so long, long I, can't I can't even read it out. But he's worked with, you know, everyone in the business. He has, he has done, done it all. all. He, he is, is just an absolute, absolute legend, legend um, performer, composer, composer arranger, arranger, and educator. And, and I just, I'll, 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 yeah, yeah, we'll just, we'll get, just straight get straight into it because I'm really, excited, really excited, excited about, about this one. one. So, without, so without further ado, further ado I'd, like I'd like to introduce, to introduce Cole Lockman. Hi, hey Nathan. Great. Glad thank to be you. here. Oh, oh, thanks, thanks for joining, for joining us, us. Um, yeah. and, and taking your time out of your schedule to have a chat and yeah, talk to us about. What you've been, what you've up, been to up to a saxophone. saxophone. So, so first, first of all, of all I'd, like I'd like to start off a bit of an icebreaker. icebreaker. Uh, mm -hmm. now, now, I understand, I understand saxophone, saxophone wasn't your first, first instrument, instrument, but how, how did you, you get into, into playing, playing saxophone? Aha, uh -huh, that's a sort of a long, drawn-out story. <laughs> 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 Have you got a you know, couple of days? No, look, anyway. <laughs> um, well, I, I was a late starter. I didn't start... Uh, even thinking about the saxophone until I was in my 20s. Okay. So, yes, and the first gig I did was, I was about 25 uh, when I sort of just, you know, was game enough to come out and play it in public. Um, so, I, I, you know, but as far as music goes, uh, you know, it goes back, you know, to where I grew up in Randwick and what I heard as a kid, you know. So, it, for me, I just... Music seemed to be always there. It was in the house playing all the time. I, you know, my dad had a very extensive record collection of all the swing stuff. Uh, he had, he liked all the classical tenor, vocal tenors, you know, like Mario mm -hmm. Lanza and Caruso and all. So this was going on all day. You know, I'd hear this, this record player, you know, in those days, that's what we had, you know, with the records in the old 78s. You know, which you've probably never seen. Have you ever seen one? Oh, I've, I've seen, seen them. them. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was well, at the tail end of it. So. 78s. And uh, so every day I heard, you know, music. It was, you know, uh, all sorts of stuff. I didn't hear any bebop, uh, but it was, you know, swing stuff like Artie Shore and Benny Goodman and um, the, the Glenn Miller stuff, all the, you know, show stuff, all sorts of things, you know. So the whole, you know thing was was there from the beginning so as i was growing up i just thought this was normal to hear music and so i think i i can't remember not liking music ever you know it was just something that sort of took me and grabbed me pretty early on mm -hmm. so um anyway so i guess the first saxophone player i ever heard and was you know my dad's record collection and that was freddie gardner do you know who that is yeah, yeah i do you yeah. know the yeah. great freddie gardner yeah. yeah and um he recorded all those uh, ballads like smoke gets in your eyes and you know i'm in the mood for love and all that sort of stuff and he was a, a huge for people that don't know him he was uh, just a huge mega star in in england and his recordings were big here as well so you know that uh, dad loved that his record so his record was sort of going all the time so I guess the saxophone must have been planted in the brain there somewhere you know a long time back but anyway <laughs> so I didn't get to that so anyway he had one of the um, one of the recordings he had in his collection was uh, Maynard Ferguson's What's New mm -hmm. And it's incredible. This trumpet playing was unbelievable. So I fell in love with this record. I kept asking him to play it all the time. And <laughs> eventually I, I got big enough to be able to go and play it myself. <laughs> and uh, so I had my eye on the trumpet. So that's what happened in the first place. And I thought, you know, so I asked. So anyway, so I, by coincidence, our next door neighbor was Frank Coglan who is, is, 
is noted to be the father of jazz in Australia. He's a trombonist mm -hmm. who led the band at the Trocadero in Sydney. Oh, wow. wow. Uh, and he, he lived over the, you know, the back fence. So our back fence is connected. And I used to hear him practicing um, the trumpet because he, he was a trombonist, a great trom trombone player, but he practiced the trumpet. And so, uh, you know, because you have to. The trumpets mm -hmm. like that, you know. And so anyway, so I hear these trumpets. So one time I got on this, you know, we had these tea chest boxes, which were about this high. And I was just big so I could get up and look over the fence, you know, because I could hear this trumpet, you know, so I was <laughs> looking over. And he saw me there and he said, look, you know, um, you know, I said, oh, that sounds great, Mr. Cogler. I said, oh, gee, you know, it sounds terrific, you know. And then anyway, he said, you know, he gave me a mouthpiece gave me a trumpet mouthpiece and, you know, and said, oh, you know, have a go on this, you know, so you, you, you know, blow into it. So, so consequently, I'm sitting in the backyard doing this and, you know, I went into my parents and said, I want to get a trumpet, you know, I want to get a trumpet like Mr. Collins. So that got knocked on the head straight away. You know, <laughs> so, no, we don't want trumpets here, you know. And so that was it. So I forgot about that. Um, and that was it. So that was the end of that. I forgot all about that. I didn't want to play the trumpet. Um, then, you know, I, if I wasn't going to, you know, play a trumpet, I wasn't going to do anything. So that was it. So then, um, consequently, after that, I, I went to, um, I, I attended um, Marsland College. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, there wasn't much of a music program there. That was in Randwick, but they did have a choir. Okay. okay. So early on, you know, I I found that I could sing, and so it was pretty natural for me to do it. I used to sing along with Dad's records and stuff. So I went into the choir, and um, that was it. So after that, um, I didn't get to the saxophone then till many 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 years later. But I did uh, start playing the piano a little bit. Uh, you know, when I was about. 17 i guess 18 uh so that was it so that was the story but leading up to the saxophone uh it's it's a long time till i get to that but there's mm. quite a few other things that um went on in between of course yeah as yeah. you know you've sort of done a bit of research and you're going to uh, ask me a couple of questions well i'll leave you with the next one so that's the story <laughs> about that how I got uh, sort of hooked on music I guess it was my parents my mother was a dancing teacher as well so she taught dancing so uh, you know the whole thing was very musical in those days that's what people did there was no TV mm -hmm. so people listened to the radio and uh, and went to dances and that sort of thing music was big and and the quality of music then was quite incredible the music, the pop music of the day, of that day, was swing music. That's what people had. Instead mm -hmm. of Britney Spears, Spears, it was Glenn Miller or something, you know, or, or whatever, Benny yeah, Goodman yeah. and Artie Shaw. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, oh a it's a fascinating, fascinating story. story. Now, now um, um, uh, we'll, uh, be, we'll talking be talking a little, a little bit, bit more about, about your, your uh, journey, uh, journey on the saxophone, saxophone and, and sort of sort where you're yeah, up yeah, to sure. now. now. But, but uh, uh, yeah, I do want to sort of detour a little bit, as you said, um, um, you, you didn't, didn't start, start off on saxophone, saxophone and you, and you had, had a bit of an interesting, interesting musical journey, journey there, there particularly, particularly as a vocalist. vocalist. Now, now um, your, your, uh, your uh, performance, performance career as a vocalist, vocalist um, is, is remarkable. remarkable. You've, You've worked, worked with some, with prominent, some prominent groups, groups in, in Australian, Australian music, music such, such as, as the Crescents and the Deltones. Can you tell us a little bit about you know how you sort of got involved with that and what it was like? Well, that happened through uh the the school choir yeah like yeah. two of the guys that i started singing off singing with were actually went to marcelin college it was then morris brothers college in Ramwick. Mm -hmm. so uh we were we were in the choir together and so uh when we sort of towards the end of leaving school we decided that we were going to um sort of like put a bit of a group together on the outside so we we recruited another guy uh, that we knew that we hung around with uh, in the Maroubra area mm -hmm. and uh, he he didn't go to school with us but he was sort of keen you know like any other teenager when you get to like teenage age you you're sort of attracted to the music of the day 
mm. or whatever. You know, it's natural to, you know, so I guess of Elvis and there was things like Little Richard, uh, uh, a lot of that stuff I started to get attracted to and like, and, and there were groups, all the vocal groups or all these different vocal groups. Mm -hmm. So, you know, out of chance, we decided to put a, a, a four piece group together and we didn't know what we were doing, you know, and we, we just sort of didn't know anything, you know, we just sort of put it together and, 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 and did all these covers. You know, there was, you know, popular songs of the day and stuff. And so mm -hmm. we started to do that and get that. Anyway, long, kind of long story short, we had a four piece group and then one of the guys left. So we ended up with three uh, and that became the Crescents. Uh, that, you know, um, Johnny O'Keefe, who was who was a, an amazing uh, rock and roller here mm -hmm. uh, in Australia. I don't know if you heard of him. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, Johnny O'Keefe was a like a talent scout, and uh, he somehow or other we went to one of his dances where he was appearing, and 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 we sang there, and he sort of decided to uh, manage us, so that wow. went on from there. So that that group sort of went for about I don't know went for about three years. We did all sorts of things. We recorded, uh, we did television. Um, we did the big shows that um, were around in Sydney at the Sydney Stadium, mm -hmm. which were uh, organised by a guy called Lee Gordon. Um, we did those. And then after that, that run its course, it got uh, to sort of to the end of the its run. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the Deltones were a, an established group, which were, uh, you know, one of the other groups that were around at that time, mm -hmm. one of the other vocal groups. There were a few, there were there quite a few. Uh, their lead singer uh, got killed in a motor accident. Oh, and crazy. anyway, the Crescents were winding up, but it had sort of run its course. It's There's a lot in between, of course, but mm -hmm. you know, it would take, we'd be here all night running <laughs> through the whole bit. But, you know, so um, he, he died in a motor accident at Brightly Sands. Uh, and I was offered the position to replace him Wow. So uh, I went straight into that, and then I was in the Deltones for about uh, five years, from 1962 to 1967. Wow! Wow! Uh, yeah. So then um, that that was it. I left in '67, and I started playing saxophone in '67. Mm. So it was more or less went straight out of that. I, I uh, during the time that these true groups over a period of about eight to nearly nine years, eight or nine years of doing mm -hmm. the vocal groups, I'd actually learnt a lot in that time about harmony and arranging because I, I did all the vocal arrangements for both of those groups and okay. all the band arrangements, all the orchestral arrangements. So I was pretty much self-taught at that stage. Wow. Um, and so, uh, I went from there more or less about a year before, uh, around about a year before that, or a year and a half before that, I started, I, I was hanging around with uh, some guys that were jazz guys, you know, they were sort of like jazz players that used to work in the backing band that backed the Deltones. Okay. And so anyway, one of the guys was a bass player. His name's John Ryan, he's passed away, but he became a good friend. And he uh, he turned me on to Bird, right, and right. you know he, he uh, I was always interested in jazz. It's just I sort of got sidetracked, not sidetracked, but I was in the other area of the pop mm -hmm. stuff. But I always liked it. I always was interested, but not in the depth where I knew that much about the people in it. You know, I'd heard of Charlie Parker, but never heard him. So anyway. Put on this, you know, we, we were on tour. I was on tour with the Deltones, and then he put on this Charlie Parker stuff, this live stuff, and it was just it blew me away. I mean, I didn't know what was going on. I couldn't couldn't understand it at all. I thought this is. I just knew it was great, <laughs> but I couldn't figure out what it was. Now I listen to it, and it still sounds amazing. It's still as amazing or more amazing than it was as I was then, but. I can relate to it and understand what's going on. But then it just sounded incredible. This guy was just playing 
amazingly, and that was it. Um, in the first group that I played in, uh, as far as on saxophone, uh, I was working with a guitarist then, Jimmy Doyle, who, mm -hmm. who was a great guitarist and uh, who I later worked with in Ayers Rock, the Ayers okay. Rock Band. So we were mates. He, 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 he used to travel around with the Deltones playing guitar and doing a bit of MD work for us. And so he was, he had a, a great lot of collection of sort of all sorts of music. So he, um, one of the guys that he liked was Plas Johnson. Okay. okay. The great um, tenor player hmm. uh, that is famous for playing the Pink Panther theme. Yeah. And, and with Henry Mancini. And I'd heard a lot of Henry Mancini's records and. And I'd listened to the saxophone player, and he said, "That's Plas Johnson." I said, "Wow, what, what? That sounds great, Jesus!" You know, so I, I started this, and, and so that triggered it off. I loved his sound so much. He, he come from the Coleman Hawkins sort of school of playing. He had that big, fat Texas tenor, big sound, and you mm -hmm. know, so that was it. Um, during the time, during also during that time. I was getting more into jazz, so I was still with the Deltones last three years, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years, but I was really getting into jazz. So I was going around to the jazz clubs and hearing different people, and I heard an amazing Australian saxophone player, Graham Lyle, mm -hmm. and he was ridiculous. I mean, he he's he was amazing. He's he's by far the most amazing player I've heard in, you know in this country ever. And he, he, he blew me away is to go and listen to him. And so I guess the inspiration of Plaz Johnson coupled with Graham Lyle uh, set me into want to sort of do this. So then the saxophone started. Once I started, that's it. I, I never stopped. I fell in love with it almost immediately. And I found uh, I was a pretty quick study with it. You know, okay. I think the vocal experience of because there's a real connection between singing and playing the saxophone. There's a real connection with the, with the vocal, the whole thing here, the production and the use of the larynx and the whole, you know, the way of the production is, is very, uh, very much like the saxophone. I think the saxophone and the, and the voice have a lot in common. Yes, yes. And, you know, the saxophone has often been compared to, you know, to be the closest instrument to the human voice. So it was a natural transition. So I, you know, within about 18 months, I took some lessons um, with Neville Thomas. Oh, yeah. Uh, and he was my first saxophone teacher, a very good teacher for getting you to learn scales and, you know, arpeggios and, you know, the basic things, you know, that are important to get your fingers moving and, you know, he was great, uh, and I also took some lessons with Graham Lyle. Wow. Uh, and uh, that was it. Anyway, there's a lot of other stuff. It's hard to sort of kind of fit all this whole story in, but I uh, hope I'm making some sense so far. No, no, it's, it's absolutely, <laughs> absolutely amazing. Anyway, I should let you ask some questions and let's see where we go from here. Oh, but I'd, I'd, I'd love, love just hearing, hearing your story, your story so, so, you know, yeah, feel, free, feel free, to free to just keep going, keep going if you like. <laughs> but um, <laughs> in, in, in terms, terms of, um, um, like, obviously, obviously that, that transition, transition from, from uh, being a, a vocalist to a saxophone player seemed to... A bit of an yeah, overlap like and a, a, a natural, natural progression. progression. Um, um, you know, yeah, being a, a yeah, uh, yeah, sort of sort vocal of group's vocal loss is saxophone's gain, and probably, probably a good thing for us because, because yeah, we wouldn't have had you uh, uh, known uh, as the amazing, amazing saxophone, saxophone player you are now. now. Um, um, but, but, but you were talking, you were talking about, about um, you got some study, did some study with Neville Thomas and Graham, and you know, being you know, having that vocal background certainly did help. Uh, catapult, uh, catapult you, you uh, quite, quite quickly, quickly along, along um, on learning, learning the instrument, instrument and, and just being proficient, proficient at it. it. But, in but in terms, terms of um, your, your we're, we're going to get to your, your uh, additional, additional studies overseas because I know that you did a bit of touring and then you actually met up with a few uh, prominent players such as Victor Morosco and Joe Allen. 
but mm -hmm. leading, leading up to that, up that point, point in terms of sort of studying things, things like that, that or, or not necessarily, not necessarily formal, formal studies, studies but, but maybe just, just things, things that you've learned along the way, way or any particular highlights that you recall that were sort of stand out uh, um, like, like sort of eureka, eureka moments, moments in terms of saxophone playing, playing or, or anything, anything that sort of really, really um, helped, helped influence, influence your trajectory, your trajectory on, the on the saxophone? I guess, I mean, Graham Lyle really did inspire me, you know, to to be, really want to do it because he was so amazing. He was just an amazing player. Oh, oh, oh. I don't know what's happened here. <laughs> it's all oh, good. You're still there. Uh, I'm still here. Let me... There we go. I don't know what happened. Something just jumped across. I've got these alerts coming through. I don't know if you can hear them. They're little dings as things coming through. Oh, no. Oh, no. Hang on. Oh, hang on a minute. I'm sorry about that. That's all right. It's, it's the beauty of live interviews. Oh, oh, oh. Where are you? I'm here. Oh, hang on. Wait there. Oh, okay. I there lost you, you for a second. Yeah, sorry about that. I just lost. Oh, no. <laughs> Oh, no. This wasn't supposed to happen. That's okay. all right. right. <laughs> oh my God! I'm oh, sorry. I can't uh, really mute that or figure out how. That's FaceTime. Somebody's calling through on FaceTime. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. And that's what's happening. Well, look. Anyway, so um, let's see. So I've, I've got being there's things. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah. So look. Okay. So look. There's. It's a long story. It's a long, complicated story. But mm -hmm. of course. What happened during the time, as I mentioned, like while I was with uh, with those to those groups, the mm -hmm. presence of the Deltones, I got very interested in arranging through arranging their vocal arrangements and their band arrangements. Uh, a lot of that, the appearances that we made were on a show called Bandstand. Oh my God. This is not going to stop. I'm so sorry, Nathan. It's all I can't, good. I, I, they're, they're ringing back and keep ringing. I don't know what to do about get, to get rid of them. Uh, it's <laughs> nice to be popular, <laughs> though, eh? Oh, I don't know. It's not even for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's for my wife, but she's oh. not answering the phone inside. Um, yeah, so uh, th there was a show called Bandstand, mm -hmm. which was um, a, a big popular show that had a lot of prominent artists on it. Uh, that you know Peter Allen and you know lots of people started yeah, on right, this show. Right. Uh, the 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 musical director of Bandstand was a guy called Bob Young, Bob Beatles Young, a great arranger. And uh, during the time I was with the Deltones, he he uh, heard some of the arrangements that I'd written for them that we used and using the Bandstand band, like you know the Channel Nine band, mm -hmm. and. Uh, he st started, you know, he said, look, when you're finished, you know, with the Deltons, I told him what I was going to do. And, you know, I was planning on, you know, taking, playing the saxophone and blah, blah, blah. And so he said, look, when you get off the road with them, because a lot of times we were just on the road traveling all the time. So he said, look, there's an arranging job if you want it at wow. Channel 9 in the staff arrangers. So, uh, I mean, I was sort of, honored because the the arrangers at the time were the big guns of there was ron falson there was billy weston there's neil thurgate uh and bob young uh and i was asked to join the the team wow of, uh, on the casual so i become uh part-time staff on the arranging side of it at channel nine so you know i'd, I'd have to write three arrangements a week for bandstand so i was doing all this and trying to learn the saxophone and Jeez. trying to play the saxophone and doing gigs and doing the uh, cole nolan's thing and and, and uh, you know daily wilson band and all these things were all sort of all happening at once it was okay. Okay. it was crazy i'm I, I don't know how i did it you know and you know it was just all too many things at once but i was young yeah, yeah. I, I, can't, I can't think of doing those things now. I'm tired <laughs> thinking about it. Fair enough. <laughs> anyway, right. look, you, you should ask some questions. I could oh, oh, we'll babble we'll, on we'll, all night. We're, we're going to certainly revisit, revisit uh, uh, that, that time, time and, and pull apart, pull apart all, all those different, different um, things you were just things you talking, talking about, about the Daily Wilson Big Band, Cole Nolan, and all that. But just take it back to the education side of things. Now, as people would know about you, you had studied with two phenomenal players, 
um, overseas, overseas. Firstly, firstly, Victor, Victor Morosco. Morosco. Now, now um, I had I the good had fortune of meeting Victor in an elevator, elevator once in Scotland, Scotland. and, and um, the first thing, thing he found, found out when I was Australian was like, like, how's Colt Lochner? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so he's quite he's well known. Well but can you tell us how you met Victor and what sort of things you did with him and sort of got out of him? Well, for, for anyone that doesn't know Vic Morosco, he's an amazing, an amazing doubler. That's all I can say. And he's not even a doubler. He's just great on everything he plays. He's a woodwind master. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, I, I went, it was 1971 or 1972 when I uh, was offered a job um, to back up an artist called Sandy Scott. Mm -hmm. He Sandy was a, a vocalist, very big here, and you know, one of the guys that appeared on bass, and I knew Sandy and all that. So by then I was fairly proficient on the saxophone, and you know, I was doing gigs, and you know, the Daily Wilson band had happened, and so had the uh, Cole Nolan's band. So uh, I was asked to join a, a group to go to Canada to back him. I had no, I'd never heard of Vic Morris I had no idea of who Vic Morosco was or who Joe Allen was or anyone. I never, had not have heard of them, didn't know. So anyway, so we, we toured right across Canada. It was a fabulous trip. It was a great band, a really good band. And uh, our job was to back him up. So that's what we did. Mm -hmm. We played all these tunes and, you know, read the charts and all that. And we went from uh, right across from Vancouver, right across to Montreal. And we finished in Montreal. Uh, going through all the other places in between, like Winnipeg and Edmonton and Calgary. It's fabulous. It was the most fantastic trip, uh, the greatest trip. Sandy is just a lovely guy, great guy, just fabulous. And he treated the band great. And we just, it was all first class. We went first class all the way. It was organized with the Australian Tourist Commission and uh, uh, Canada Air. And okay. so it was a sort of combined thing that was sponsored, I think, somehow or other. And we got paid great money and everything was wonderful. Finished up in Montreal and I thought, well, look, I don't want to go straight home. You know, you know, it was so close to New York. So I thought I'll go over across to New York. So I spent, went to New York, spent, hung around and heard, you know, Mingus and, you know, all sorts of stuff wow. there. And then I thought, well, I'll go to LA. I just always was fascinated. I was so interested in arranging at that stage. and. Um, uh, I thought I'll, I'll go across to to um, to LA and see what's happening over there. So anyway, so I got there and you know went around and started to look around for a place. I thought, no, look, I'll stay here for a while, see what I can find. You know who's here, and you know go around see if I can see some studio recordings and see if I can hook up. I had a few connections there mm -hmm. and knew a few people. Uh, one of them was a guy called Ray Leatherwood, who was a bass player. And he was a bass player with Les Brown's band um, uh, years before that. And he, he ran a motel over there. And so I stayed at the motel where he was at. And uh, anyway, one day I was in, in my room and I was practicing and um, there's a bang on the door and I oh no, you know, it's in a motel, somebody's going to start complaining, you know, like somebody's banging on the door. He yeah, says, yeah, big yeah. bang, bang, bang. And I thought, oh no, you know, so I went to the door very sheepishly and opened it. It was Ray Leatherwood. Right. And Ray said, listen, he said, you know, there's a big band rehearsal tonight uh, over at the so-and-so or something. He said, look, you know, that one our tenor players pulled out. Would you like to come and sit in with the band, you know, and I said, oh God, I'd love to, you know, and I was a pretty good reader, you know, I'd, I'd done, you know, the Daily Wilson big band, so I could mm -hmm. read okay, and that was okay, I was confident that I'd be not make a complete fool of myself, <laughs> so anyway, so I got there and uh, arrived there and walked in, and there's this guy there standing there, and he had his alto and his flute and his clarinet set up on the peg anyway, and he was actually putting them together you know so and he put them all together and he picked up his flute and he played this chromatic scale from low c right up to high c and back and it went 
Wow. wow. It was so fast. And I, I just, I was blown away. I thought, this guy can't be a doubler, you know. This, the doublers can't sound this. My flute doesn't sound this good, you know. And, and um, anyway, and then he picked up the clarinet. And it, it, was, it was beautiful. It, it wasn't like that clarinet that I heard. It was the real clarinet sound, the real orchestral clarinet sound. He picked it up, it sounded gorgeous. Anyway, we went to start playing and he was playing lead alto. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he played very good lead alto. He didn't play any solos. Vic was never a jazz musician, really, as far as the solos go. He wasn't a great improviser and, you know, that wasn't his bag. Um, but anyway, so after, you know, during the rehearsal, I, I, I was just so taken up with his doubling that I thought I've just got to have lessons with this guy, you know, I've yeah. got to grab him, find out how, how you can do this. What, what's the secret? How do you, how do you get this good? What do you do? Well, <laughs> no, there was no secret to it. You know, the guy had studied with all sorts of people, Daniel Bernard on a clarinet and he'd studied wow. with Joe Allard. He was a Joe Allard student as well. Right. right. He'd studied with Julius Baker on flute and, you know, yeah. all these fantastic Tom Knifefinger, I think, and all these fantastic flute players. So it was a real deal. So anyway, so I went to his house and, um, you know, the next day or whatever, I was keen to have a lesson, went over there and uh, he started me uh, on, you know, Joe's methods with, with you know, the overtone series. And um, he completely turned my playing right around um, on saxophone too. And, um, but mostly I'd, with Vic, most of the study I did with Vic was on flute mm -hmm. uh, and a fair bit on clarinet, uh, but mostly flute. He really helped me with the flute because I was struggling, you know. I still struggle. <laughs> it's still a it's still a hard instrument, you know. But but sure uh, is. but it, uh, it 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 got easier once I got the right stuff, you know. Wow. He he got me onto some amazing. He has some great drills and routines that he's developed based they're all sort of off joe's joe allard's method they're they're everything that he teaches is joe allard but vic's got his own thing he's a highly intelligent guy he's invented his own way of, of presenting it and he's got these drills and things that he does um breath attacks and all these things that he does and uh tonguing exercise and you know I learned so many things and I still use those things today in my teaching and I'm still trying to develop them get them better and better mm -hmm. uh, as most of Joe Allen's students still say the same thing I run yeah, into yeah. people like Eddie Daniels and you know Dave Liebman and people like that and they still talk about Joe Allard mm. and they still they still go back to what they learned from Joe and they still thinking about it and yeah, yeah, yeah that's what drives them and inspires them today you know even i think yeah, yeah. Um, um now, now speaking, speaking of joe allard um, um let's, talk, let's about talk about your time, time with him, him. Now, now um, um for, those, for those who may, who may not, not know, know do you, do you, would, you would you mind, mind telling, telling, us telling us a little bit about, about joe yeah, allard? Uh, joe joe is a real legend yes, yes. he's the real deal um joe joe allard was professor of saxophone at Juilliard from the mid 50s to about the 80s. Um, and he replaced um, Vincent Abato. I don't know. Do you know Abato? Do you know his recordings? Oh, you should vaguely. check him out. He's a beautiful e bear in Glasnow. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Vincent Abato. He okay. was a phenomenal clarinet uh, player. And uh, he's his uh, eBay recording, I love it. It's, I think it's beautiful. It's absolutely lovely. Um, uh, I did, give, you know, talking about so where I don't want to get off the track. So we're Not talking about Joe, but um, Graham Lyle um, introduced me to Marcel Mule. Mm -hmm. So he, it was, that was the first time I heard Mule. And when I heard that, and I still think he's the best. <laughs> you know, but uh, when when I heard that, I just knew you know you could do anything on the sex when i heard yeah, yeah, the mule yeah. recordings just amazing and so uh that was that was a bit of an inspiration too for me that drove me on to think not that i've you know 
can play any classical saxophone. I don't profess to be able to do that, but um, it, it inspired me to look further, mm -hmm. to not think of the saxophone as not being able to do. It can do anything. Yeah, it's yeah. just just who's yeah. playing the thing. You know, that's it. <coughs> yeah. So uh, Joe, getting back to Joe. Mm -hmm. uh, so Joe replaced Vincent Abato. And uh, as a professor of saxophone at Juilliard, he also taught at the Manhattan School of Music. Okay. He okay. taught at the uh, New England Conservatory. Mm -hmm. he, and um, he, he was the bass clarinetist uh, with Toscanini uh, uh, with the NBC Symphony Orchestra, which was conducted by Arturo Toscanini. Yeah, yeah. And he was the only bass clarinetist that Arturo, uh, that Toscanini used that never got fired by Toscanini. <laughs> <laughs> Joe was a, an amazing guy. He, he, was, he played the, the principal clarinet on the Bell Telephone Hour, which was a radio program. And the rest of the winds, the oboe and the, uh, the rest of the winds, were all uh, first chairs of the New York Phil. Mm -hmm. And Joe was the clarinet and alto on that show. So he was a heavy, he was a heavy duty. A uh, guy that was uh, just a monster, you know, musician, you know, mm. and um, one of the greatest teachers that I think has ever come out of America, and uh, certainly one of the first, as far as I know, he was one of the first to start teaching overtones in the USA. I don't know if he was the first, but he was one, of, certainly one of the first to stress the importance of the overtone series. Mm -hmm. uh, and he found that by accident, uh, I think. Really? He, really? Uh, yeah, he found that uh, by accident. He, he, he said he took a flute lesson once with, and, and the flute, the, you know, and he didn't have a flute. So, the, you know, the guy said, well, how am I going to teach you, you know, for a <laughs> So he, 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 he showed, he said, well, look, you know, the flute doesn't have, a, have, have an octave key. You know, you, what you've got to do the rest with your lips and your airstream. And so he played this, you know, he said, if you play uh, the F, you know, and then you drop the octave, you have to, you know, you have to yeah, do yeah. that. You have to do it with your lips. And so Joe said he went home and started experimenting with that and uh, decided to see if he could play F, uh, the second F, um, on the saxophone, the F2, mm -hmm. uh, and see if he could play that and then drop down to the other one. And he did it with, try to do it without the octave key, because this guy had said, well, there's no octave key, you know, so. Yeah. And he got that to work. And um, he said he, 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 he had, that was his first exercise, was the octave drops of dropping the octave down and then going down a semitone and going right down to low B flat and then starting on the F and coming back up uh, and doing it the other way. So that was, uh, I guess, eventually he must have heard of Sigurd Rascher because he wrote the Overtones book and that yeah, book, yeah. you know, I guess, I don't know when that book was written. I'm not sure of the year. Uh, maybe, maybe 30s, 30s or, 40s, or 40s, I think. I think. Yeah, but yeah. I guess that might've, I don't know. Well, it might've it been, might later. been later. It might've been later. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure about that, but, uh, but anyway, look, Joe, uh, as I said, played with, with uh, the NBC Symphony Orchestra, uh, all sorts of things. He was professor at Juilliard, but mostly what he's known for, uh, the students that he's taught, I guess the famous students that he's taught, like Stan Getz, yep. Eric Dolphy, uh, Michael Brecker, Bob Berg, Dave Liebman, um, Eddie Daniels, Victor Morosco. Uh, there's a long list. There's there's some classical. He must have taught classical people because he taught at Juilliard, and I'm assuming there was no jazz at Juilliard in the fifties. Mm. I don't think there would have been. So uh, I guess he taught the repertoire and taught all that. But everyone I know that started with Joe. It was just tone production. That's what it was. Basically, there was never you'd play a note and then Joe would stop, stop you and say now and then he'd go into this long story. <laughs> and this story would go on. It was something an experience 
like you know one story he used to tell was and he, he he'd tell it oh he, poor joe in the end he 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 died of from alzheimer's disease oh. so uh he parroted got very repetitive and even when i studied with him he he'd repeat him the stories a lot but you know but it got worse apparently and um later on and he passed away but one story he tells that when he was uh, when he was hired by Toscanini to play bass clarinet and in with the NBC orchestra and anyway he tells his story about this piece and I've got to get it right because I'm not a classical musician so I, the, the title might be wrong I think it's called Till Yule and Spiegel Opus 38 by okay. Richard Strauss I think that's what it's called okay so okay, Till okay. Yule and Spiegel Opal opus 38 <laughs> by richard strauss i think that's a name but if somebody if anyone's listening that knows because they'll say he doesn't know what it's not called that but that's it's something like that yeah yeah i think um and joe told this story about when he went in there and he said the the, the bass clarinet solo or the piece that he was playing was started on a low e the very low e on the bass clarinet and then went up yeah two octaves to the high e. okay and the first time he played it he said Toscanini stopped the band and started going with his arms like, <laughs> <laughs> like, like this <laughs> and, so, and so Joe had sort of played it like a chicken you know yeah, and right. he wanted it played loud you know so <laughs> anyway <laughs> Joe said he, he played it louder and then tossed his, he was saying louder and louder. So Joe's blowing the hell out of this thing. He said he blew the hell out of it. And, uh, and he said, in the end, he said, after that, he said, he said, Toscanini never said another word to him. And he was the only bass clarinet player that played for Toscanini that, that didn't get fired by Toscanini. Yeah. And he said, then he sort of brought up a point. He said, but Toscanini was hard of hearing. He was pretty deaf. So that's probably why right, he, right. he couldn't hear the bass player at the low E. Because there's not a lot of projection on a low E on the yeah, clarinet, yeah. you know, on the bass clarinet. So then Joe would sort of go into a story about how, what you'd have to do if you wanted projection okay. down there. And if you had your lip too far back or whatever, you know, it'd bring it out a bit you'll have left cover you'll be able to get it to bark and so that all his stories led to something that he was talking about or you might have asked him or whatever or it may, you may not have even asked him that he'd be he decided to tell you that <laughs> and then he would demonstrate something then he'd pick up and he'd say well look if, if you're going to play this note and you're going to do this and you do this, you're not going to do well. If you go up into the high register and you do this, it'll absorb all the highs in the sound and blah, blah, blah. So mm -hmm. you do this with your lip and you do that. And so everything that I started with Joe, uh, I use in my teaching and everything made sense. I mean, the thing about Joe Allard's teaching is that he had people, incredible people, you know, all these classical guys. I think Harvey Patel, do you know Harvey Patel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Harvey Patel was one of Joe's. I think Paul Cohen, do you know him? He's the guy with that has all the millions of saxophones that Paul Cohen, he's got the greatest saxophone collection in the world. He's got yeah, all these strange that. saxophones, slide saxophones and all these things. Um, and uh, anyway, so yeah, so that was it. So Joe would, you know, give you, he covered everything. I mean, it didn't matter. It was breathing, it was adjusting reeds, it was embouchure, it was, you know, uh, playing in different situations, playing subtone, playing whatever. It was, he just knew how to do it. And he knew, he made it very natural. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lesson with Joe was filled with stories, long stories they'd go and then, you know, and you wouldn't get to play anything if you play, you know, not that I wanted to go and sort of play, you know, like listen to me play something. And it wasn't like that. Mm -hmm. When I went, I wanted to find out what it was all about. I'd studied with Vic and Vic had set the, set the, set the wheels in motion for me and helped me more than any other teacher. So if I had to credit anyone for 
any success I've had, it have to be Vic Nolasco. He 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 was the guy. Uh, and then when I started with Joe, I wanted to go to the horse's mouth or to the source. Mm-hmm. You know, that was the reason I went to Joe. Uh, and I think I got a deeper understanding of it going to Joe. Um, of the mechanics of, the mechanics of playing? playing? Because it was di- it was presented in a slightly different way, very different. Not, mm-hmm. not as far as the principles. The principles of it were the same. Right, it's right. just when somebody studies with someone, there's always going to be their take of it yeah, right yeah. no matter what but if you go back to the guy that invented this particular thing which was joe allard the joe allard system of playing uh seems to be there seems to be a couple of schools of playing and and his is certainly an important one um as far as american players go mm-hmm. especially jazz players you know yeah, it's, it's quite a legacy like, quite a legacy of you know yeah, incredible yeah. guys and uh, and they all sound different joe never said you've got to sound like me or you're going to sound like this or what he didn't care it's just if you know if you can get this instrument to do what you want it to do and get it to speak when you want it to do and get it to you know get it be able to play in tune be able to play your low notes and be able to play your high notes and be able to use different tone colors uh, that was it for Joe. He never had one way where this is how you've got to do it, and this is this is it. And you don't change, and your homage has got to be you know this, and it's got to be that. He 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 impressed. One of the things he impressed on is that it's all in the ear. That everything you do has got to be pre-heard, whether it's playing a note or whether it's playing a jazz solo. Or whether it's whatever it is it's mm-hmm. always got to be the mind has got to be the first thing and then everything else follows after that wow. uh, as far as you know the embouchure and the you know the tongue and you know stuff the diaphragm was something that he didn't if you mention the diaphragm you know i made the mistake of mentioning the diaphragm <laughs> in one of the lessons uh because we we're talking about breathing and i was, uh, and he said well what's what do you think about breathing and i said well i guess you know it's the the diaphragm and bang he banged the table the <laughs> diaphragm the diaphragm is a lot of malarkey he said <laughs> <laughs> the diaphragm you can read books and about the diaphragm you know and um anyway uh he he uh he he thought, and I I agree. I think there's too much emphasis that he did, and 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 I agree. And I haven't thought too much about it, but I mention it because most people mention it as diaphragmatic breathing. But you can't breathe without using your diaphragm, you know. And you mm. can't, you know, the only way, you know, you if I'm talking, I'm, you know, the air's coming out, so the diaphragm's doing something. And if I, <coughs> that's the diaphragm. If I. <coughs> That's the diaphragm, you know, you can't make, if I stop and don't breathe, I can't get my diaphragm going. It doesn't do anything. It's, mm. So Joe was, uh, you know, very adamant. He, he just said, the problem is thinking about the diaphragm is that, you know, put the air in, in the lungs. Yeah. yeah. It's where it goes. You know, it's got to be deep breathing. You know, the idea, you don't want to like breathe like this so that you're breathing and you're not you know, fully breathing. So his take on breathing was to really, to really relax, like, like meditation, you know, and just, you know, taking the breath through the nose. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very relaxing. And then the minute you start to think there's the diaphragm, you know, you start to tense your stomach and tense everything, you know, and, uh, so that was one of the things that I learned. I never mentioned the diaphragm again. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but it was funny. He banged the table. And, uh, and that was one of the things. And uh, he was a master of... Um, I could talk about Joe Allen for 10 hours, you know, and, and I, I wouldn't have to even stop to breathe. <laughs> well, I would because diaph- I'd have well, to well, use yeah. the diaphragm to breathe. And so, oh, diaphragm. Um, but he... Um, he he was just an amazing man he he was a compassionate person he was kind 
Uh, he was highly intelligent, which amazed me when he got Alzheimer's disease because, of, you know, they tell you, keep using your brain and, you know, you'll be right, you know, mm, forget it. If anyone used their brain, Joe did, he, he never stopped using it. Maybe you wear it out. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's maybe. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe you're better off to not use it much, you know. Um, but he, 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 he'd studied all sorts of things like anatomy. He knew so much about anatomy. So if he went into something, mm -hmm. it went into great detail. If he went into physics, it went into great detail. A lot of his stuff was based, not based on hocus pocus, it was based on physics. So he'd explain to you about something he was doing with the embouchure or the tongue or whatever. Um, and so there's all that, you know, sort of thing about, you know, both Vic and Joe uh, taught the tongue position. And the tongue position was to keep the tongue up against the back teeth, high up, and uh, to keep it out of the throat because the tongue was like, to Vic used to say, the tongue is the enemy of tone. Mm. That's what he would say. And it is because it can, you know, you put the mouthpiece in your mouth, you can't see your tongue. You put the flute up, you can't see your tongue. You, know, you can only see your tongue when you sing. Ah, oh, you know. And then once you put something in your mouth, you, you, you know, your tongue can get in, you know, bad position. So your tongue can close your throat because yeah, it's yeah. connected to the back of your throat. So, you know, um, part of Joe's teaching was the, the tongue position, the high tongue position, or what Americans prefer, uh, refer to as anchor tongue, anking the back of the tongue up against the back teeth. And that way you don't draw it down. So there were a lot of things like this, you know, that I studied and it's too detail to go into everything, but I studied every aspect of that sort of thing with Joe. Wow. The embouchure, how it works, how the lower lip and the, you know, works and how you can change it and color it for different colors and, you know, tone colors and all that sort of stuff. And, um, but yeah, he was just a, an amazing guy. He knew so much. I mean, that's the thing. He, he was just so learned. He'd studied with people as well. He studied with, um, uh, Daniel Bernard um, mm -hmm. on clarinet. Uh, he studied with another guy, um, Hamlin. I can't think of his first, Gustav Hamlin or something. Okay. And he'd start. He'd he'd taken not taken lessons, but he'd he'd learned from people that he worked with, opera singers, and right. he'd ask them, you know, about different things that they were doing when they were singing and what the feeling was in their throat and all this sort of stuff. Uh, and oboe players, uh, he'd, he'd sit for hours. He sat for hours uh, with, a, with a guy, his last name's Bloom, famous. He was in the New York film. Oh, Laurie? Uh, Ro Robert Bloom. Uh, um, Laurie? Laurie? I can't remember. Um, mm. that's, uh, these would have been going back a bit, but he, right, was, right. he was the oboe in the New York film uh, years, years back. Okay. And he discussed things about embouchure and and uh how they approach the double reeds and you know that works so a lot of his things were based on a whole lot of stuff that he he'd accumulated throughout the years he played with you know he, he wasn't a jazz musician but he must have been able to adapt pretty well he played with um red nickels and his five pennies oh wow wow yeah, and with Red Norvo for a period of time. and But most of his stuff was done with, uh, you know, symphony orchestras and, you know, he was a, mm -hmm. you know, clarinet and saxophone. He didn't play the flute. He took one lesson or something and that was that what led him to the kind of the overtone series. But right. <coughs> anyway, you should ask me some questions because I'll babble oh. on, and especially if you ask me about Joe because... I, I, I love Joe Allard and so did every one of his students who studied with him. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, they rave about Joe and I've never heard anyone say a bad word about Joe. And as a teacher, he was just amazing. So I'm still, I still use his methods. I try and incorporate my own things into them. But mm -hmm. basically I teach Joe Allard uh, 
as far as tone production is concerned. I try to be as true to that as I can, and I'm still still feel I'm learning. You know, I haven't stopped trying to learn. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. still trying to get it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, we'll definitely definitely come back to that because because you're known known as, as, um, uh, I don't want to put a label on it, but you're known as sort of the fixer fixer when it comes to undergraduates undergraduates when they come along to the jazz course course and they need a bit of work on their their tone and stuff. But we'll be talking about that. Just a question from the gallery from Carla. He just wanted to ask, how long did you end up studying with Joe for? It was short. I studied with Joe. I had one a one-off lesson with Joe. when uh, on the first trip or the no no I, yeah I went I had made a couple of trips overseas and I did some things over there I had made connections through Airs Rock and so I had connections to get some work and do some things and anyway the first trip I went there uh, it was a short trip and Dave Liebman set it up for me and he said because I I knew who Joe was from Vic but you know I hadn't followed it I just I hadn't followed to find out about Joe. Vic had told me about Joe and I didn't sort of hear that know much about it. I just knew what Vic had told me. And so I didn't sort of pursue it. I didn't look into it. I should have, and I didn't. And anyway, I was uh, hanging around in New York and hanging around with, with Dave Liebman. And he said, look, you know, he said, uh, I'll take you out to Joe's. Why don't you go out and see Joe? Take a listen with Joe. It's amazing. You know, but, you know, but, you know, and I said, I've always wanted to, you know, do this. And, you know, you know Vic talked about him. So, so anyway, I went out there and, uh, and Dave Liebman took me out there by car to Joe's. And anyway, I went in and Joe, and this was at his home in, uh, in, um, oh God, I'm trying to think. I've had a mental block, um, New Jersey. Right, right. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't think of where it was. And, uh, Downey. Down here, uh, something drive in New Jersey. Anyway, okay. okay. I went there and and uh, Dave knocked on the door and he opened the door and and then Joe did this great impression of Dave Lee, <laughs> which was you know because Dave's you know was, yeah man you know yeah man you know I'll see you on Tuesday or maybe Thursday you know so I got this Bronx sort of you know yeah, what, yeah, yeah. I'm not very good at but anyway Joe did that you know when he when Dave came in he said. Yeah, you know, he did the sort of bit of a bit of a Dave Lehman impression, and, and David said, "Yeah, you, you, where's that case? Where's that saxophone case you were going to bring over?" And you know, Joe said to him or something to Dave. You know, he was promised um, Joe he'd bring this saxophone case or something over, mm-hmm. and he anyway, said, "Okay, come in." So we went in anyway, and then Joe chatted with him, uh, with Dave, and then Dave left. Okay, so then Joe. Joe, uh, I was, we were in the lounge room or somewhere, and then Joe said, oh, look, you know, my little studio's there. It wasn't a studio, it was just a room. So I went in, and so it's a very, very small room, a, mm-hmm. a quarter of the size of this room, you know, oh, just wow, like, wow. No, no, nothing. Like a, like a, like like a, a toilet, cupboard. Like, yeah, a bar, yeah. like a small bathroom, you know. And then there's a chair there, and there's two chairs, you know. There's the student chair. And there's Joe's chair, you know, and so he, he sort of pointed to where I was going to sit. So I went and sat in the chair. And uh, and there were a couple of photos of Train up on the wall, Coltrane, a couple yeah, of photos yeah. of Train. And there was photos of Joe and, you know, in, in you know with different people and all that around there. And anyway, as I sat there, I sat in the chair and I thought, my God, Stan Getz has sat in this chair. <laughs> Eric Dolphy sat in this chair. All the Glenn Miller sax section have sat in this chair. Wow. Uh, you know, I'm thinking, wow, you know, I just, I, it was just one of those moments that you think and you think, and here I am in this chair, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, so that was my first lesson. And the first lesson was just Joe talking and stuff. And that went by and, you know, it sort of was a story and I played a note or something. And then that was it. So I didn't get a lot out of that lesson. So the second time, I thought I'll make a trip back and especially to set up to go to take some lessons with Joe. And so it was about six weeks I started with Joe. Mm-hmm. Uh, and anyway, I, I rang him before I left and because I planned to do it in New York, you know, go to New York and, you know, do it there and do some things while I was there. And so I rang him up and he said, oh, I'm sorry, I'll be I'll be in my holiday home in New Hampshire 
Well, New Hampshire was miles away. It's it was amazing. like a six hour drive one way. So mm -hmm. I thought, oh, I don't know. So, so anyway, so I, I ended up staying up there when I had my lessons. I stayed at the house oh, wow. with Joe. Wow. So I, I was very lucky. I was very fortunate. So I'd have a lesson on the Saturday. Uh, you know, I'd get up there, drive up there on Saturday and have a lesson and then have dinner with them. Mm -hmm. With him and his wife, and the next morning, I'd have um, I'd I'd have it. We'd have another lesson. Then I'd drive back, so it would be six because it was a twelve-hour drive, and so yeah. I couldn't have done it in a day. And he wouldn't let me. And he was a lovely guy, and so I did that for you know five or six weekends. So you know I had a a, a lot of time to really get into it, mm. uh, and uh, you know hear the stories and you know study the methods, watch, you know, he, he did, he, Joe was really a master with fixing reeds. He really could make reeds work. I'm still working at that. I'm better at it. I, I've got a lot better. Uh, mm -hmm. I can get them pretty good and I can fix them up sometimes for students and, you know, pretty well. And it's made life a lot easier because the reed is, you know, the thing that makes the sound. And if it's not working, you know, then you know, you're not going to be very happy with things. So yeah. uh, I, I studied that with him uh, and all sorts of things, you know, that mostly with Joe. I mean, I'm talking a lot too. I guess I've got that from Joe. <laughs> Maybe I've got that from <laughs> Joe. But, but that's the way I conduct my lessons a lot of times too because I feel like sometimes, you know, you can just get, you know, in in Joe's words, and this is Joe word, Joe's word, if somebody... <laughs> would come to him with a problem. You know, obviously Stan Getz, Michael Brecker, Eric Dolphy, all these guys, Glenn Miller, these guys were tremendous musicians. They didn't yeah. study Joe with, when they were children. They studied with him when they were adults and when they were recording stars, you know, big stars. They'd go there and, you know, there'd be some sort of thing they'd want to find out about, about their tone production. And then in Joe would say, well, I, you know, it, it, it might be a low note, a high note, you know, breathing, you know, whatever. It could be something, you know, a pitch, something, some area of their playing that they want to get better. And, you know, they went to Joe to, to do it out. And he'd say, well, look, most teachers will give somebody some exercises or a book and say, look, if you go and practice these books, it'll fix it. And he said, you know, the student then goes away and practices these exercises. They still, still can't play the low notes. They still can't play the high notes. They're still playing out of tune, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. whatever. It, 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 you've got to have answers. Mm -hmm. if, pe if people are in trouble, you need, you need to have answers. And so that was Joe's method of teaching. And I've tried to, uh, you know, follow that path if you want or, or or you know rather than just tell people look just keep practicing because sometimes that doesn't work sometimes you're doing something in the wrong way uh or you're going about it in the wrong way or there's a lot of tension or there's something yeah and you can't get out of it and you need someone to pull you up and go look you know mm. i think you you know if you do this you know this may help you and you give them answers rather than just send them away to tell them to practice more because they're already doing that and they'll just get frustrated, you know? Yeah, yeah. no, it's no, important it's to have someone, have someone who can who actually can sort of explain, explain what's going, going on and, on and yeah. you know, I have that understanding of things. Have that understanding of things to know that, you know, uh, to be able to troubleshoot. Yes. yes. And that's what Joe could do. And Vic Morosco too. Both of those guys, they're unbelievable teachers, unbelievable. I mean, Vic's, Vic's well known as a lot of anyone that's, you know, going to watch this that, that plays classical music will know Vic Morosco because of Blue Caprice, I guess, yes, because yes. it's become a very famous uh, piece. And uh, Joe, uh, Vic did that on a Maya mouthpiece. Okay. okay. He recorded that on a Maya, so he didn't use a classical mouthpiece at all. He just, and he could do anything, you know, on it. <laughs> he, he was flying all around on it and, you know, yeah, yeah. It's, it's he, he didn't have any trouble. Mm. I don't know if it, how big the tip opening was. It could have been 
could have been a four or five. I don't know, but it, uh, he played a five, I think. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah. Right. He didn't have any trouble. Right. Well, um, yeah, well, yeah look, as you as say, you, you could talk, talk about these guys, these guys for hours and hours and hours. And and hours. And yeah, I might yeah, have to hit you up on a separate, separate session, session just talking, talking about, about maybe Joe and, and um, just, just going into more depth. But we should probably move on to some other things. One last sort of important mentor figure for you that I'd like to ask you about is your relationship with Oliver Nelson. Um, um, now, now, I understand, I understand, he, understand was he was quite an influence on you and you helped and mentor you on a few things. Few things. How, did How did you two meet and, and, you know, yeah, what, sort what sort of things did he help you out with? Out with? Oh, uh, enormously. He had enormous influence on me um, regarding my arranging mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because he was the most amazing composer and arranger. Um, and uh, I, well, it was on the trip that I did to Canada. So it was the oh, first yeah, yeah. time I went to America, which was 1971 and 72. Yep. yep. So That's the all one with that, all that happened, yeah, all that happened was, so I vet, met Vic Morasco and I took wow, the lessons wow. first list with Vic and I met Oliver Nelson and it all happened at once. It was just fantastic. You know, everything was going on at once. <laughs> yeah. um, how I come to come in contact with him as a trombonist from Melbourne called Peter DeVisa had been to LA and he'd met um, Oliver Nelson <clears throat> and he said he's an amazing guy he said he's just the greatest guy you've got to you know go and say hello to him and you know he, he'll really help you you know and stuff so anyway so I rang him up and I was almost reluctant because you know I knew who he was and you know he's, he's just this famous amazing person and I, I was you know a bit reluctant to ring him up and I wasn't calling him for lessons or anything. I just, you know, do. I wasn't game to ask him for that. I just, you know, oh look, you know, you know, I'm so and so from Australia, and you know, um, I'm a friend of Pete DeVizas, and oh, how is he? And you know, and blah blah blah, and uh, you know, and he said, oh, what are you doing in LA? And I said, oh, look, I've just come over here. I just, you know, wanted to hang out and you know try and hear some things in the studios and things like. That. And he said, well, look, he said. Um, why don't you meet me at Universal Studio on Tuesday? I'm conducting uh, some music for the Six Million Dollar Man, which was a TV show. Wow. <clears throat> and he said, um, so, and he said, uh, I'll, I'll meet you there at two o'clock or something. So this was amazing. So I thought, geez, you know, this is fantastic. So I, I landed there and sure enough, he come through and I waited at the gate because there's a boom gate there and security. Mm -hmm. And so he said, hop in the car, you know, come in and, you know, I'm Oliver and, you know, it was like, you know, it's just unbelievable. So anyway, I went in and um, watched the the recording session. Uh, he let me stand by the podium with him while he conducted. Wow. Uh, he was conducting to film. So everything went to film. Band was, was all there. Um, Ray Brown on bass. Cat Anderson on trumpet. Shelly Mann on drums, all these amazing guys. Like it was like, you know, walked in the room and all these <laughs> people from Ellington Band and, you know, like ex spacey guys and all this stuff. Um, it was incredible. And, you know, they did everything in first takes. You know, the guys in LA, you know, just, you know, at that time were just one amazing. take one. Yeah. You know, it still would be now. And, but, you know, the, the standard of, I've been used to the standard in Australia and that was very good, you know. Then I went to LA and this was in the early 70s. It was like, it was like chalk and cheese. And, you know, the guys were so good and so, so incredible at, at, at just doing it. Like first take, they'd run it down once and then I'd record and they'd, they'd, they'd be, it wouldn't be easy to be in funny time signatures and all this sort of stuff. Oliver wrote some very difficult stuff. And, you know, he'd, 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 he'd say to somebody, put that line up the octave, you know, you know, after the first run, the guy had put it up and it, there'd be no mistakes, you know. And so it was just fantastic. So I watched that and um, I'd learned a lot, you know, from watching his, I was able to sit there and watch the scores, uh, mm -hmm. look at the scores and wow. see what was going on. and. Uh, later on so that happened and then um i went back to my apartment where i was staying and uh he he phoned me up 
and uh, called me up and said, oh, hey, hi, hi, Cole, um, this is Oliver. And this is, you know, I didn't expect to hear from him. And, and he said, um, do you want to come out to the house? Uh, you know, on wow. Saturday or something. So I went out to the house and he was really friendly. And um, it's a long story, but I, you know, I didn't formally study with him. It wasn't where I studied with him, but I studied <laughs> from him if you know what I mean, like yeah, yeah, yeah. just being around him and being able to, you know, I spent quite a bit of time at, at his house. As a matter of fact, my wife and, and um, two kids were over there uh, as well at this trip and they come to the house and his kids played with mine in the pool and we, we had barbecue and then I ended up, then she went back to Australia and I stayed over there for a little while mm -hmm. and he, um, he just, it was amazing. I stayed over at the house and and used to sit up with him and drinking. It was <laughs> he liked to drink. He liked scotch. And in those days, I I didn't mind a drink myself. Then <laughs> I was young and um, and so we sat up and listened. He he put on. He had ma the master tapes. The whole uh, top floor of his um, house was gutted out. So it was just like an enormous space, like a recording studio space, right. you know, a big, big area. Yeah, Had yeah. two grand pianos, a Moog synthesizer, one of those Moog synthesizers, yeah. which they had in those days, you know, with all the plugs in them and everything. Um, and he had uh, like uh, multi-track recorders and he had all sorts of stuff in there, in the room. I don't know what, he must have done some recording in there, of course, hmm. um, at some stage. And... Um, He'd put on the master tapes, he'd say, look, uh, have you heard this album I did with, uh, with Johnny Hodges? And I said, no, he put on the master tapes and stuff, you know, and anyway, it was amazing. I, I, I don't know why, I don't know why, why did he like me? I don't know, I, I, I don't know why. I still, to this day, I guess he was fascinated. I don't think he knew anything much about Australia. He'd met uh, Pete DeVisa, but he was very interested in uh, what was happening here with with the indigenous people? Mm -hmm. uh, he wanted to know all about that. He he also was fascinated with saltwater crocodiles because I don't know if they have any over there, but we have them here. They run around in cans, and you know, yeah, I yeah. told him they come down the street, you know, in <laughs> cans, uh, and all this sort of stuff. So we talked about a whole bunch of things, but um, and so. I spent quite a bit of time with him and at the studios. I went to all the studio calls. I wanted to learn, you know, I was there to, to learn. And I got so many ideas about orchestration, about how, how he'd couple certain instruments together, mm -hmm. how we'd mix certain things, the combination. He had unusual combinations of things. He'd use like two basses and things like that. And he, in a big band, he'd have two basses instead wow. of one. And stuff like that and you know it's done i've heard it done since but um just amazing it's just you know he recorded with everyone he recorded with anyone you could think of you know all sorts of Thelonious monk and he recorded with phil woods and uh did albums with you know all sorts of people did all film music and marvels so i've got a lot of his albums and um anyway it was funny because he didn't know I was a saxophone player. It's funny, we were never talking really? about really? sax. No, because it was arranging. <laughs> I never said what I did. <laughs> I know we just somehow I never discovered. And he was an amazing saxophone player. Yes, he, yes, he, yes. he was a great saxophone player. Um, and uh, but so we after this was after a while, after a couple of times I met him, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, we started talking. And then I said, um, I really love your book, the the. the the patents book yeah, yeah, yeah. and I said uh, I've been you know really getting into it and practicing it. and he said Gee, that's a hard book on trombone I said I said uh, I, it's on trombone he said D do you play trombone I said no no I play saxophone <laughs> anyway I've got an album signed by him which says dear Cole I'm so sorry. I thought I played you. You played the trombone. <laughs> <laughs> I've got it in my record collection, um, and then you know. Uh, so yeah. So I didn't. He didn't know because I was just so into arranging then. Mm -hmm. I was really into it. I you know. I was sort of the. 
I was into the saxophone too, but I, I was so into the arranging because I did so much of it. I did three years with Channel Nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, here yeah. and then, um, you know, and that was full on. You know, I was writing full time. I was doing sessions in the day and, you know, writing all night. I was never sleeping. I didn't get any sleep. <laughs> but when you're young, you don't need sleep. That's right. You That's bounce right. back pretty quickly. Yeah, now I need more. But, you know, then, then I didn't need any. You could bounce back. And the next day you'd go and do a session and then yeah. come back and then have a sleep and then get up and write all night and then get up and do a session the next day. And... Jeez. Great times. <laughs> but anyway, that was the story with Oliver Nelson. So and unfortunately, uh, he died in, I think it was 1975, uh, which was just, I, I was back here and I heard it on the radio and I cried, uh, just, yeah. just broke my heart, you know, cause he was just a lovely guy, you know, very giving. I, I don't know why he gave me all that time. I just don't know. I still don't know. Mm-hmm. I think it was just, he was just generous and saw that I was keen and enthusiastic perhaps and wanted to help me. And he did. It was enormous help. Yeah. Great. Yeah got a lot out of it I you know I've learned many things from that you know about writing and it it, it spurred me on to want to look further into it you know and find different things yeah yeah yeah. that's That's an amazing amazing story story. yeah yeah yeah. it it is and it's it's like a dream you know it's like it's like a dream but it it happened (laughs) Mm. um Um, just, just wrapping, wrapping up, up uh, you know, yeah, you've, you've you know, yeah, got, got some, some amazing, amazing experiences, experiences and you've, and you've learned, learned a lot, a lot um, during, during your time. time. Is, Is there a there standout, a standout um, um, I'll, I'll hesitate to say, to say lesson, lesson, but maybe, maybe like a, a standout, standout um, um, maybe, maybe moment, moment where, where there was something, there was something that you learned or an aha moment from any of these people that you uh, recall, recall as being like a really sort of defining moment for you as a player or a ranger. As a player, I think it was Vic. It had yeah, to be yeah. Vic Morosco. Um, it, 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 it really changed things for me so much for the better, you know. I mean, I'd, I'd already been playing for quite a while and I'd recorded, you know, two or three albums on saxophone. Of, you, you know, I don't know, I was with the Daily Wilson Band and Colin mm-hmm. Allen's band and I'd done things. So, and I was already doing studio work and doing things and stuff, you know, uh, but it just changed my, the whole direction I went in, in terms of how I practiced and what I practiced before I didn't really think about it. You know, I thought about you play the saxophone. I didn't kind of think about the obvious things that you were supposed to. I wasn't really told anything about embouchure from mm-hmm. the teachers that I'd had prior to that. Um, the stuff I'd studied with Graham was, uh, Lyle was improvisation. Um, and the basic stuff I got from Neville, uh, I can't remember, it's a long time back. And, you know, I just pretty much was then went on my own with it and, you know, was doing certain things and I guess well and other things not as well. And, you know, when I went to uh, Vic at just changed it. It made sense. It, at first, it didn't. At first, it was so strange. Mm. <laughs> you know, that when you're learning something qu- quite different or something or different the way you've thought about it, it, it sometimes it, it. So it took me a while to get onto it. I think, and and not living in America, I couldn't study it long term like a lot of people like Dave Lehman and Eddie Daniels. You yeah. know, studied for years with Joe and you know and all that. <clears throat> Eddie, I think, was still going to see Joe when he was, you know, absolute monster and, and, and playing with the Thad Jones, Mel Lewis band and recording all these albums and stuff. I think he was still going to Joe for advice wow. when he was doing some of, you know, the recordings, you know, just there'd be a passage or something that, you know, he might have been doing because you know as you know Eddie went on to pretty much play clarinet only yeah yeah uh and you know he's a doubler an amazing doubler too uh and uh but the clarinet sort of took over I think the clarinet was always Eddie's love he loved it Eddie was great he was he was something I took a couple of lessons with Eddie too 
yeah, yeah. Uh, improvisation lessons. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just just to get his take on <clears throat> what what to teach. You know how what what was not what to teach so much, but what he did, okay. what routines he did, and. Um, that's a that's a story of itself too. With Eddie, <laughs> Eddie was really uh, possessed. Eddie's possessed, you know, totally. Yeah, yeah. He, I, Eddie, you know, just he doesn't put the clarinet down, you know. Right. If, it, yeah, the the clarinet, so you know, it's like it's glued to Eddie. You know, Eddie was a real practicer, and probably now at this stage in his life, I spoke to him a while ago, and um, on on uh, FaceTime. Mm -hmm. uh, just not so long ago, and uh, I think he'd still be he'd still be the same. He'd still practice a lot. It, Eddie's just one of those guys that obviously, because of how great he is, he's, he's a monster. Oh mm -hmm. God, it's unbelievable. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> he was helpful too. He helped me get work in New York and get studio work in New York. Wow! wow. I did some things. Um, <clears throat> Eddie. Uh, uh, Eddie was a very busy guy and um, he was running from one studio to the, the other and, you know, get, doing different things. And so he got me to fill in on a couple of uh, times in the sessions, mm -hmm. you know. He said, look, you know, I'm going to be late on this session. Could you go in and, you know, fill in? So I sort Great. of got the gig and, you know, didn't have to pay him for the lesson. <laughs> got the gig and he still kept the gig because he got someone to cover it. Because yeah, yeah, he was yeah. going to be like, you know, an hour late or something because he was doing something else. So I got to play with some good players in the studio. Ronnie Cooper and, you know, oh, wow. um, Derek, Jerry Dodgen and Randy Brecker and all these guys were on these sessions. And I went in and uh, sat in and did the best I could played as well as I could uh, you know they weren't hard they weren't hard sessions they weren't things that were featuring Eddie you know like if there was something where you know they were they were section things big band oh, okay. big band things just over yeah, yeah, yeah. things I did a few things like that I uh, did one session on clarinet he said he called me up one day and he said oh there's another one tomorrow and it's clear I was oh Eddie clarinet <laughs> He said, look, it's easy. It's easy. It was. It was pretty easy. I was okay. But yeah, the other yeah. guys were great. They were all really good players. And so it was an experience to sort of play with the New York guys. So they certainly played at another level. They were awfully good. Yeah, they were yeah, awfully yeah. slick. So I got a lot of opportunities from being over there and meeting all sorts of people. So lots of, lots of different things. I was very lucky, I think, to come across all these people and just be at that place at that time and yeah, yeah. and be amongst it and, you know, yeah, playing, playing with those, with those guys, guys, guys like just, just yeah, yeah just you know yeah. well uh, yeah it was yeah. you know I played you know I'd done a lot of studio work I was used to you mm -hmm. know having to come in and somebody count you in and play so I was used to doing that um but it was a pretty high level you know, if you stuck out, you'd stick out. You'd really stick out. Yeah. Luckily, I didn't. There was nothing, you know, if there had been sort of like all shot notes and things, you know, like, or, you know, if that had been in, you know, 1115 or something, <coughs> <laughs> if there is such a time signature. But, yeah, um, yeah it, was, it was pretty straight ahead. It wasn't, I don't think, uh, you know, I wouldn't have liked to go in on anything really, really hard. <laughs> it, was, it, it was fairly easy, but it wasn't that easy. It was, mm -hmm. you still had to read it and read it down. And I did fine. I did okay. I was okay. Did all right. right. I, you know, I felt like I did. Okay. I sat next to Ronnie Cuba, actually. What was he so, like? Yeah, like? I was playing second tenor and um, I, he was on my left. Mm -hmm. He sounded unbelievable. Yeah. What a sound. He's got He's the got dream, dream Barry, Barry sound. He really he does. does. Oh, my God. But sitting next to him, what a sound it was. So yeah. focused. Such this focused biting sort of big fat sound and uh amazing yeah what was he yeah, like there's a story there's a cool story guy. there there's a story there if you want it but we could go on forever but there's a story there oh, oh well oh, may oh, as well i'm well. getting rid of this <laughs> oh. um oh no go on to something else that that's all right fair enough. Fair enough. i can't get rid of this i've got I don't know why my mail thing's in one corner. It's not in. You can't see it, can you? No, no, no. No, no it's silly. This 
I don't know. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Oh, computer. Don't worry about that. Yeah, it's like my mails come up on one side of the screen. It doesn't matter. I <laughs> can still see. <laughs>